Welcome to Off Hours, a conversation between John Edwards and Chris Manning. So over the last year, along with working on building a watch based on someone else's movement, which we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit in terms of where that project is and how it's coming along. Uh, I've also been doing some research into designing and making a movement myself. It may just end up being something like a Halo project where it's, you know, something I make one or two of and, and it's not not something that I make a lot of, uh, but I want to try making my own watch from scratch and see how much of it I can do. Obviously, there's things that I won't get around to making. I have no interest in making springs. I have no interest in making, you know, jewels and things like that. Uh, but there's a lot of it that I do want to make, and I'm kind of curious to try that out. And getting a good escapement is one of the challenges of making any watch movement. And while the Swiss have mastered the art of mass producing their lever escapement, uh, there are other options out there. One of the projects I ran into recently was the open moves, open source movement project. Uh, it's at uh, spemt.com. And uh, I came across this actually through an interview that I was listening to with Dan Spitz. Uh, we've chatted about him once or twice, I think, uh, most recently in the context of uh, his watch bench that he had made. He was actually um, had a design for a, a very large and solid watchmaker's bench. Uh, he's a former guitarist of Anthrax and has, uh, since his Anthrax career, has become a a master watchmaker himself, and he's he's in the process of designing and building his own watches from scratch in the U.S. And one of the advantages of this whole COVID lockdown thing is that a lot of people are doing interviews when they hadn't previously been doing them. And he has been on a bunch of podcasts recently and uh, video interviews, doing uh, you know chatting with other watchmakers and whatnot. And uh, uh, when I was listening to one of his conversations, he brought up the fact that he's taken this open source escapement and he's modified it slightly and he's using it for his own purposes and um he's he's redesigned it for use in his own watch uh, did you have a chance to look through this and and see a little bit about this uh, this movement yes yeah, so i've taken a, a peek at the the project and uh it looks very interesting um in some respects uh definitely revealed some some new things to me but on the whole uh i i'm very much in, in favor of, of an open source movement being developed. And it's actually something I, I've thought about in the past, most significantly back when I was really in watchmaking in school. Right. I can see that this is sort of a similar thing that, that transpired here because this project was, was very much uh, birthed by and, and the result of uh, a number of students in the Lycée Edgar Faré School in, in France. Mm hmm. And so that it, I think there's just something about that that time in your life. Uh, yeah. It's very optimistic and, and, you know, just full of all, all sorts of, of hope. And uh, sometimes you can actually make something of that. And yeah. uh, at least in this case, they've, they've been able to birth this project, which is, is fantastic. I mean, the result of, of uh, our aspirations as, as horological students at uh, the school where, where I was, we definitely tried to make various movements uh, of our own and, mm -hmm. and whatnot, uh, but we didn't have the same sort of support and, and encouragement from the, the <laughs> teachers right. uh, that these students uh, clearly do have and uh, the support of industry as well. Just the way that the school is, is equipped is absolutely phenomenal and, and the students that, that the school churns out are uh, likewise uh, in a... I wouldn't say a class of their own because there are other f fantastic schools as well. Hmm. But um, as the, the principal of this school has touted, uh, these are the, the elites uh, of the industry. So sure. they are in the, the top echelons of the, the watchmakers and, and watch technicians that uh, graduate and then enter into industry. Uh, so this is a yeah, fantastic project. Uh, I'd love to, to see it uh, come to full fruition. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to seeing where this this blossoms and grows into yeah this this project is definitely interesting and i know i think it was a uh, remy pools mm -hmm. he's actually used this escapement in a watch that he's built uh or that he's in the process of building so i'm i'm curious to see what comes out of it from his watch and i'm really interested in actually getting a hold of the cad files for it 
one of the nice things about a lot of watches, a lot of movements, this industry is old enough now that a lot of this stuff is out of patent protection. Uh, you know, you can take a 6497 and you can do whatever you want with it because it it's no longer protected by, by copyright or any kind of patent. Uh, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that Ed is going to hand over technical drawings of that movement or technical drawings of the escapement itself. And so it's it's a little bit frustrating if you want to rebuild that escapement. You kind of have to do it from first principles on your own. One of the nice things that that appeals to me about this project is the fact that you don't have to do that. You know, you can see what these people have done. And if you do want to make tweaks to it, if there's something that you want to change on it, then you can do that. And uh, they've they've geared this, I think, towards the 6497. And that's the, you know, that's sort of the size of, of movement that they're gearing it towards. And uh, which is appropriate because that's sort of what I'm trying to build my movement around is is uh, sort of a base 6497 movement. Uh, the mainspring that they plan on using for this is a 6497 mm-hmm. mainspring. I don't know what they're doing for the hairspring. I hadn't gotten around to finding out about that yet. Uh, but I suspect it, it may be a 6497 hairspring as well. So I'll be really curious to see what happens with uh, with this and how difficult it is for me to get a hold of the files because they don't have them just freely available on their website. I think you have to contact them and, and explain who you are and what you're doing with it, which is a little bit frustrating, but at the same time, uh, you know, if they don't, maybe the, I, I don't know if they're quite 100% ready for, you know, the world to see yet. So we'll have to see where the where they're at and and see what they're willing to share at this point. Yeah, that's something that's not quite in in the spirit of open source. But again, all this is in in French. Yes. And uh, so all I was able to ascertain spring wise is that the mainspring is being used. I, I didn't see anything about the the hairspring either. So it may not be so much that uh, you you haven't got around to reading it yet. Hmm. As uh, they, they may not actually publishing anything. Yeah, they may not have anything about in it in that respect yet. Um, I'm somewhat curious to know i wasn't able to to find or, or didn't see um what sort of license they're they're planning to use for the, the open source nature of it did you yeah. come across anything about i that? haven't come across that either i mean they talk about it being open source but uh, as you say they are not develop, developing it in public which it sort of goes against the whole idea of open source uh software at least and hardware other technical hardware that i've i've participated in before so it sort of does go against that a little bit. And I don't know if they've chosen a license scheme that they're going to use for this. And if it is what, you know, what that's going to be, I haven't come across that yet either. So uh, I'm going to get a hold of them this week and see what, what's actually happening. There was another project that I found linked to through this, and it is an open movement project where they're actually developing a movement that they want to be able to make available to people. And they've uh, designed it. They've got all the CAD work done. And they're looking to make kits that are available for watchmakers. So I think the idea being that um, it's going to be sort of a uh, an inexpensive kit that you can purchase. Or you can also get the uh, the CAD files to be able to actually produce it. Their project is a little frustrating. Uh, when I was chatting with um, with whomever it is that, that's behind it right now, or at least answering their email, they don't want to release any details of it until they've produced the initial batch of kits that they want to be able to test. And, you know, they want, you know, they need 300,000 euros to be able to, to build them, and they, they want a year to be able to actually get those those movements out there and, and built, uh, which seems a little excessive for a prototype movement like this. Uh, you know, I think you could probably move it, make it for a lot less and and sort of at least get the prototypes out there and figured out whether they work or not. I think that they're contacting somebody in industry and having some company make, you know, produce them from start to finish for them, which is why it's going to cost them so much and take so much time to actually do. Uh, and they're unwilling to share any details of the project, you know, the technical details of the project until then. So that's a, that's a little bit frustrating. And, and to me, you know, if they if they don't already have the money and the and the means to do that first prototyping, it's unlikely they're going to get it anytime soon. Uh, I don't see anybody in the industry going out of their way to actually back a a sort of quote unquote open project like this and and make it available. And most individuals are not going to have you know access to three hundred thousand euros to be able to get a project like this off the ground. So I 
I would love to be wrong about that, but I, I don't see that project going too far. Hmm. Yeah, for producing at industrial scale, uh, $300,000 or euros is actually quite inexpensive. You're usually looking at upwards of a, a million Swiss francs to get a, an industrial scale movement up and, and off the ground. At least that's that's how the state of things were right. like a, a decade or two ago. But Yeah, in this case, they've already done all the all the technical work to get that, you know, get that movement designed. So there, you know, that cost has already been absorbed into the project. So my understanding is this is purely just a production, Hmm. um, you know, production costs, which again, if you're, if your goal is to do a shakedown of the design and actually see whether it's working or not, uh, you know, you should be able to make these parts, uh, you know, if it's, if it's designed the way that, if the design is really doing what they say it's going to do and it's something that a watchmaker can build on their own, then a watchmaker should be able to sit down with these drawings and make them from start to finish and be able to actually, you know, get a working prototype going. So um, we'll see what happens with it. I, I don't hold, you know, I don't have a lot of high hopes for this project to, to actually get anywhere. I think that this open source escapement is actually more interesting and it sounds like they're actually sharing that information with other people right like dan and and uh, remy as i said they're they're actively working on or have watches built with this this escapement in it so i'm really curious to see what that is and and how much of that they're willing to share right now and whether they're they're willing to share the drawings of it because i i would love to sit down and, and experiment with it try actually making it whether it's something that i actually use in a project going forward or not i don't know uh, but at the very least, it would be interesting to try making one and see how feasible is it to to manufacture something like this in my own studio in a you know at a small scale. So my understanding was that the end goal for the SPEMT was also a, a full movement as well. Is that is that not the case then? Are they exclusively focusing on the escapement? I I understand that they're focusing on the escapement, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, my impression was the the escapement is, is kind of like the, f- the first thing, and then you build your, the movement out around the, right, right. the escapement. And a lot of the drawings and, and whatnot I had seen so far seemed quite Daniel's inspired in the the layout and, and structure. But uh, again, I have I haven't dug in fully, and uh, again, this is all in French, yeah. which is a, a second language for me. Yeah, French is a third language for me, and uh, and no, never one that I was very strong in. So I've been leaning very, very heavily on uh, Google Translate, and uh, I've been using Chrome and Google Translate to be able to, to be able to get through this this page. Uh, but I, at the same time, it means that I I can't easily read it on my iPad. So that's where I do the vast majority of my technical reading these days, and and so it hasn't been I haven't been able to sort of dig through it as much as I'd like. Yeah, I haven't thrown this at Translate yet. Maybe I should do that and uh, see if that sheds some some different twist on, on some of, of what I, I had been reading. Yeah, the the Translate actually comes out pretty good. I'm impressed with what it what it does, and uh, I'm looking forward to iOS 14 and and Mac OS 11 because they're going to be building Translate into Safari and into you know into uh, on both the the mobile and the the desktop platform. So I'm curious to see how that works. And I I know so far with Chrome, which I hate running because it's such a it you know consumes so much resources when you're when you're using it it's it's a frustrating to run. But if uh, Safari does even half as good a job as what Chrome is currently doing with Google Translate, then I'll be very happy with uh, with the results of it. We don't have to run Chrome to use Google Translate. You're right, but it works significantly better because you can tell Chrome to auto always translate French pages, for instance. So I have it set up to always translate French, always translate German, Italian, and so I don't I don't have to sit there and say, you know, put the URL into Google Translate. I can just browse to a web page and it will automatically translate it for me. Mm-hmm. And as you say, it has gotten remarkably good mm. over the years. And uh, when you dig into to some of the development and the technology behind what's made this possible for programs to essentially teach themselves languages, uh, it is really uh, remarkable and, and fascinating technology. And yeah, now you've got stuff coming out in, in things like iOS 14. And then of course, uh, there are, are apps and programs that have done this before where you can actually have a, a conversation sort of back and forth with someone uh, on the fly and then have it all, all translated live and, and Google's had stuff like this for Android yeah. a, as well. And uh, I mean, just look at GPT-3. 
uh, right now and what it's capable of. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, soon, I, very soon, I think we're going to have machine learning algorithms that are, are better at translating than, than humans your are. typical human yeah. translator is. Uh, there is, I mean, some certainly when you get into more technical writing like this, though, it, it is very easy for uh, machines to, to not quite get the the nuance yeah. or the um, the semantics uh, of what's going on correct. Uh, I do recall very early in, in my, my training, uh, going to watchmaking school in French, I did rely on, on translators and, and things like this for, for helping me understand and, and grok some stuff because mm-hmm. my, uh, my level of French was very low when mm-hmm. I first started in the program. And uh, you sites like like Babelfish and and stuff, yeah. and just some of the translations that would come back for technical terms were just hilarious, and <laughs> uh, it, like you would not be able to make heads or or tails of what it was actually trying to tell you unless you had some idea of uh, the the French words that that were at play, and then that they actually meant something to you. Like for me, especially, just like having a professor point to a part and yeah. call it what it was in French. And then I could be like, okay, so this random, this moon <laughs> that his translated article is talking about is actually this piece over yeah. here, or this anchor mm-hmm. is is this piece over here. Yeah, the it, the technical translations that I have seen so far inside of this this site seem to be pretty good, mm-hmm. and so that's that's certainly improved a lot. But yes, you're right. The some of that has is painful, just how bad some of those those technical uh, conversions can be, and they they just don't work right. I get that with a lot of the um, the old documents that I've read in terms of jewelry making, uh, especially when you start getting into medieval Italian and mm. and you know so Google Translate does a great job on modern Italian, but it's mediocre at best on medieval Italian. So trying to translate some of you know like Cellini's stuff and and whatnot, it's uh, it's a little bit difficult when you're when you're reading it and you're like uh, I don't think that's exactly what you meant, right? So Even anyway, medieval English can be tricky. <laughs> talking about so is that even english <laughs> but i i can't remember offhand how it translated escapement on me one time but mm. that that stands out for me as, as being a particularly hilarious once i finally figured out what it was it was, it was trying to <laughs> to tell me just looping back again to the students behind this project or graduates rather that they are no longer students they have all since graduated uh, from the school there in france um, I, I kind of alluded at the beginning to kind of be mildly disappointed, shocked. I, I don't quite remember how I phrased it. Uh, but learning that Remy Cool's uh, tourbillon uh, was made possible uh, in large part by by the schooling and, and by this collaboration with all these other students. I don't want to in any way say that it, that it dampened... Um, the, the impact of his work because uh, we've spoken about Remy before in the, in the mm-hmm. past and he actually won uh, an award uh, that we, we spoke about on the, the SIHH episode and uh, rightly so that's absolutely deserved mm-hmm. um, and I, I still uh, 100% uh, applaud all that that he has achieved um, but the, the significance I guess of his achievement was brought down a level for me seeing that uh, I don't think it would have been possible without the, the collaboration uh, that he had with with all these other students and the support that he had uh, of the teachers at the school and, and of industry and having access to this sort of equipment. I mean, it it really does take a village. Like, no man is an island. And, uh, I mean, even guys like, like George Daniels, yeah. you know, it's very easy to romanticize and, and think that they did absolutely everything, 100% themselves. And the reality is that it's, that's simply not uh, the case. So I should actually say, I, I, was, I was all said and done, I would say I'm encouraged to, to mm. see that uh, that, that Tourbillon by Remy Cools was made possible in part because of a lot of what's presented here on SPEMT. Mm. Uh, having that insight uh, actually is, is kind of reassuring. I can, don't have to feel so <laughs> belittled. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, why haven't I uh, come and, and finally finished uh, making this, this Tourbillon? Yeah. Because I've certainly tinkered around with, with tourbillon movements and sure you know i've made plenty of, of components for for various watches but I, I myself have yet to make something a to c mm-hmm. like 100 of, of my own vision 
And uh, he certainly, when you compare what he did to, to what the other students did mm. using these similar building blocks, he's evidently Very in, in a class of, of his own, particularly visually, but, but technically mm. um, as well. Um, so it, he definitely benefited yeah. from the, the environment that he was in. I think this this fetishization of the individual watchmaker making everything by hand is really doing the industry a disservice, especially the independent watch industry. I've been listening to a bunch of other podcasts where people have been talking about independent watchmakers. And, you know, every once in a while, somebody will, will sort of be disappointed because, uh, you know, a watchmaker is using CNC equipment or they're buying their you know, their escapement from somebody or they're, they're salvaging it from another movement or something like that. And, and I, think, I think that's really doing independent watchmakers and the industry as a whole a, a huge disservice. The reality is that doing all of this work by yourself from scratch is next to impossible, especially doing it on, on manual machines. Now, when I say next to impossible, I don't mean that it's not technically possible. Absolutely. All of these are things that people have built, often with lower quality equipment, more primitive equipment. So it is it is technically feasible to do all of these things. But there's also the reality of living in a modern world where I have to pay rent. I have to put food on my table. I have to, you know, buy, buy transportation. These are things that I, that are that just a reality of living in a modern world where I, I can't sit down and build a movement entirely from scratch and design it all from scratch and have all of the tools to be able to do all of these things. It's just not practical to do all of that. And while there are certainly are some people who have done it, uh, you know, you take the, the famous examples, of course, are Daniels and, and Smith. But the reality is that Daniels didn't do all of that design and work entirely on his own. He had other people who helped him and assisted him with doing all of that. You know, again, same thing with with Roger. He's he is the the public face of that brand, but the reality is that there are people who stand behind him and help him do the technical calculations and help him with CNC programming and running their CNC mills and things like that and then doing assembly and stuff. There so at the end of the day while these individuals are doing significant work and what they're doing is incredibly impressive. They're also not doing this entirely on their own. And when people are sort of, they're disappointed to find out that somebody is using, you know, let's say a CNC lathe for being able to turn screws or wheels or whatever it is, or they're using a CNC mill for, for machining out their, um, you know, their bridges or, or whatever, uh, whatever it happens to be. The reality is that, no, you know, nobody can really afford these watches. If if you wanted to pay me to build a, a watch entirely by hand, develop the thing, you know, com- from from the ground up, it would take me years to do, and most people couldn't afford that watch, right? How do I sell enough of those watches to actually make a, a comfortable living off of that? And it, the reality is that you just can't. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm not disappointed to see that he that he was able to do this through the resources that he had available to him you know what he did was still an impressive technical challenge and and uh, certainly an impressive artistic challenge as well but it just highlights the reality of building in this world right you just can't you just can't do it all yourself mm-hmm. and it's it's nice to see that um, that that's you know that reality is is sort of more obvious now with this yeah disappointment is is absolutely the the wrong word i, I don't quite know how to to describe Sort of the, the how I felt in, in the moment when all of a sudden the, the veil was lifted and mm. I realized um, how much of a common language was shared among all these very different watches mm-hmm. with Remy's piece. Even still, the, the fact that they're essentially modifying a, a 6497 at the end of the day. I mean, that that's the remarkable thing, too, is um, I'm always really impressed when I see just how far someone can push mm-hmm. uh, the boundaries of sure. what that movement is, is capable of and, and how it can be portrayed. Yeah, disappointment's the wrong word. It's more so all of a sudden realizing, oh, there are a whole bunch of other watches out there that that share a lot of the same mm-hmm. traits, and it's because they, they work together as a team. Absolutely. And then they, at the end of the day, just brought their own face 
sure. to to the watch and and portrayed it in the way that that they dreamed of, of portraying it. And and there is a strong tradition of doing this kind of thing in the watch industry, mm, at, you know, taking other people's ideas, taking other people's work and building upon it. And that's how we've gotten to where we are. We've spoken about uh, the Hoberings, Richard Hobbering, and some of the remarkable work that he's doing. Almost all of his watches are based on a, on a, at a 7750. And he's, you know, he's taken away a lot of the, the stuff that he doesn't want. He doesn't have a, the automatic movement on it. He often takes the chronograph out of there as well. And the reason that he's chosen to use a 7750 is because it's a solid movement and it happens to be the right size for the watches that he wants to do. And it's a 30 millimeter movement. And once you strip away all the stuff that you don't want, like the chronograph and the, and the, the automatic, it's actually a reasonable thickness as well. So you can suddenly make a nice watch out of it, a nice dress watch out of it, and it isn't, it isn't overly large. And, you know, again, a lot of students take a 6497 and rip it apart and, and turn it into whatever they want. This, you know, this course that we talked about last time with Christian Lass, again, taking a 6497 and customizing the, the main plate, customizing the bridges and cocks, and turning it into your own watch, there's, you know, that's that in and of itself is an impressive piece of work and is worthwhile rewarding the person, you know, that watchmaker for doing it because it is still technically challenging what they're doing, trying to do that work and then get the the watch doing what they want to do, the, you know, and then adding complications on top of it. Uh, with, you know, with Richard, he's often doing interesting things. I, again, they're, what they're doing is impressive work, regardless of the fact that they're building on a base. That's just what allows them to actually do the work that they need to do and make it economically feasible to do. Uh, you know, you can buy a, a Richard Hobbering watch for under $10,000. If if he had to build that entire thing from scratch, you'd be looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not, you know, million plus dollars to be able to get those those watches into your hand because somebody else has already done the work of making an escapement and making, you know, making other parts. Uh, again, a Philippe Dufour, he designed that watch, but, you know, let's say the simplicity, he designed that watch and I'm sure that he has the skill to be able to make that watch. But he's not making all of those watches himself in, in his shop. A lot of those components are being made for him and that's what allows him to actually make, uh, you know, watches and, and be able to make a living off of selling those. And to, to underscore the I don't look down on in any way the work that that Remy achieved here is that I wish that I had a school environment like he had. I would love to have been there with these these students working on this project as they had. Yeah. And uh, essentially moving towards bringing this this open source project to to life. Mm -hmm. And we touched a a little bit on, on some other open source movements and, and things that, that are out there and you know i too do hope they, they eventually succeed but i think the the reality is with when it comes to making an open source mechanical watch movement um the thing that i mean there's obviously um intellectual property issues that mm-hmm. come to mind and uh definitely have to be be dealt with and and respected but uh, I, I think the the reason that we now live in an age where something like this uh, is possible is because of the, the technology side, both hmm. in terms of the, the machines at our disposal and also just how quickly information and the, the essentially the technical data to replicate a part can be transmitted. Hmm. And I think for an open source movement to succeed, it needs to bear that in mind and, and that needs to be foremost getting the plans and and the drawings out there making the the license for that very clear mm-hmm. uh, for instance is it the the sort of open source movement where you are free to to modify it and keep those modifications to yourself or whether if you make a modification to the movement where you then have to to push that change back into to the pipe right uh, as well and that's part of the agreement of, of using the movement is if, if you work on it and modify it and improve it in some way they then have to, to contribute that mm-hmm. back and uh people can come down on, on either side of of that and that's not something i'll take a side on uh at the moment i, w- I would lean more towards uh pushing the, the changes back in so that the movement continues to to improve uh but that's neither here nor there right now but but i think for it to 
succeed for any project like this to succeed. It, it's really important to get the, the drawings and the information out there yeah. because otherwise, I mean, just about every mechanical movement is open source. Yeah. I mean, you, a watchmaker takes it apart. Uh, look, that's part of my job is, is reverse engineering a component and, and making something to, to fit what's missing or to fit what's broken. Sure. And uh, like by their very nature, watch movements are, mechanical watch movements are in a sense open source. Right. Uh, so to take that to the next level and really make it uh, something that is open source in, in the modern sense uh, is to make it really simple and straightforward to, to replicate a part. And that's kind of part of the, the dream of what we had had with, with Alain Solager was getting a lot of parts information out there, service information, and then the, like a sort of pipe dream was to actually have it so you could download CAD files right. to quickly produce uh, a part that was missing or, or broken in a, a watch. Not going to ha- happen at this this point. I certainly don't have the bandwidth for it. Yeah. Um. But but that's sort of uh, our our dream when we we first started on that that yeah. project. It, that's an important point. And again, if for somebody like me to be able to sit down and and work on this, I should be able to say, okay, I I can I certainly have the tools to do ninety nine percent of the work that would be involved in making these these movements. I can't make the hairsprings, but I should be able to buy those hairsprings. They should be either something that's available or something that's based off of an existing hairspring design. So I can say, you know, I need 100 hairsprings for a 6497, and there's a supplier that I can find that can get those to me. Same thing with the mainspring. I'm not going to make mainsprings. Um, you know, jewels, well, that's that's not so difficult because I can always change the size of pivots or whatever to, to match the jewels that I can get a hold of because I know that I can get a hold of jewels in various sizes. And, you know, I should, it's not difficult for me to, to modify their design if I needed to, to, to use the jewels that I happen to have. Um, shock settings, you know, what are you doing for a shock setting? Is it something that I can actually get? Is it something that I can make myself? You know, are those jewels available? Are the, the springs available? You know, if you're going to use something like an Inca block, how am I going to get a hold of that? If you're not going to use an Inca block, what is it? And, you know, where, where is that available to me? I should be able to get, as a, as a watchmaker, I should be able to get access to those things or at least know and understand how to make them. And that's something that this project really does need to be able to do. You're right, to, to be successful. Mm-hmm. And I mean, even just, you know, starting with the basics, there are, are people who've, who've clearly reverse engineered the, the 6497. Sure. And uh, while you can download models of it on the internet, I've yet to find anything that is, is actually accurate to a, a true 6497. And you got my hopes up there the other week, and you, you said you had found something. Uh, but then, then you messaged me a little later and said that, it, in fact, it, it was not dimensionally. Oh, yeah. It was miserable. Um, I, I haven't looked at the plates yet to see how accurate the dimensions are on the plates, but the wheels are all wrong. The pinions are all wrong in terms of dimensions, and even in terms of, of tooth counts, they're all completely wrong. So I'm in the process of drawing up my own model of a 6497 in Fusion 360 because I want access to it. I want to be able to look at it. And as I'm designing the components that I'm I'm planning on adding on to, you know, I'm I'm working on adding some things. Again, no, nothing, none of this stuff is revolutionary. I'm taking ideas that I've found from other people and I'm remixing them in other ways that I think will be interesting and will look good. But at the same time, for me to do that easily, I want to make sure that I've got an accurate model of the thing that I'm working on. Whether I use that for actually programming a you know CNC mill for being able to to drill out holes and things like that that that's that remains to be seen. But at the very least, I want to have accurate dimensions of all of the wheels. I want to have accurate tooth counts on them. I want to be able to look at them and say, how are these interacting? Where are they going to go? Where can I move them? Right? Because if I know those things, then I can say, all right. These two wheels need to be positioned in this relationship to each other, you know, in order to keep the, the, the tooth engagement right. Well, once I have all of that, those wheels and everything modeled up in, in Fusion, I can start to do those sorts of things. And I can change the layout as I need to if I, if I need to and, and have access to that. So, again, the 6497, no longer under patent. You know, Etta is not going to come back to to you know, say, oh, you're not allowed building your own version of a 6497. They don't have any rights to it anymore from that point of view, which is why we see, you know, the Seagull ST3600 out there. And 
I th- I'm sure there's other companies that are making clones of it now. And that's why we see those things so commonly available. Uh, and in my case, I want to be able to make my own 6497 with all of my extra little bits and pieces in it. But at the same time, that is not going to give me drawings of that stuff. They have all that. They have everything. They have, I'm sure they have 3D models of all of this stuff. And they could easily send it to me and say, here you go. These are, this is exactly what you need. I mean, heck, even trying to find dimensions of how far away is the sub-second, you know, pin for the, su- you know, for the second hand, how far away is that from the center of the movement, you know, from the center, the center wheels? There's no good information on that, right? And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that the, that Seagull has reversed engineered it, what, which is why they have dials out on the market that you can easily buy and drop in your 6497 and they'll fit. But again, they're not sharing that. Um, so unless you reverse engineer it yourself, nobody's sharing those drawings out there. Nobody's sharing, sharing that information. And who knows, maybe if mine, mine are good enough and, and I'm happy enough with them, maybe I'll, I'll put those out in the world so that other people don't have to sit there and struggle with it because it is frustrating. Uh, and it, you know, one of the, we've talked before about Eterna and one of the reasons why I've worked with Eterna and I'm trying to get movements from them is because they were incredibly generous and open when it came to making making the watches. They're not going to give me CAD drawings of the actual, you know, gears and and everything for the and the plates and everything in the movement. But they're, you know, they said to me, here you go, here's a 3D model which shows the outside dimensions accurately of the movement. And here are drawings that tell you exactly where all of the hands are to be placed. They tell you, you know, all of the the dimensions of the uh, like the moon phase dial and everything like that. I know all of that. I don't have to guess because Eterna has given that to me. And I know that, you know, one of the moons is off by one and a half degrees from the other one on the on the, the design. So when it comes to printing that dial, I know that one of the moons has to be off by one and a half degrees on the in the in the print. Uh, you know, in order to look right. I don't have to guess at any of that. If you find a seventy seven fifty one um, and you want to build your own, you know, you want to print your own custom moon phase for that. Again, Ed is not going to give you the, the, the dimensions and the, you know, exactly where the moon should be and everything like that. And that, you know, on that plate in, in order to print your own custom, uh, moon phase. And, and I, you know, I can understand why they won't, but at the same time, it's frustrating that that stuff's not out there. So yeah, it's, we'll see what happens and we'll see how far I get with, with, doing this 3D model of the, the 6497 because I think it's something that would be nice to, to actually put out in the world and be able to say, here you go. Here's the actual dimensions as far as I can tell. Mm. Yeah, and it's understandable why companies like Etta, and I mean, even Eterna won't give you their, their CAD drawings. And uh, yeah, I mentioned to you uh, the other week too, I had seen this, this beautiful render of a of Asheron Constantine movement mm. up on the, the Blender yeah. showcase so blenders this this 3d program that is open source and uh i i got in touch with the the fellow who had made the the render i was like wow how did you model that what do you do you know i'd, I'd love <laughs> to to play around with that that file and, and um like happy to pay you for it da, 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 da. he's like oh sorry i can't send it to you actually i got those files from vacheron constantine <laughs> and it was solely for the purposes of, of making like a essentially a promotional right uh video for them um, so, so there are certain people they will send the cat drawings too, but it's with all sorts of, of I'm uh, sure there's some really paperwork and significant and NDAs and but, yeah. But it was very surprising to see that that published on a, an open source yeah. showcase. Yeah, sure. Um, but th- that's that's the other problem that these open source any open source initiative has really is, is how do you keep the lights on? So you mm. need to have some sort of a business model in a sense, and whether that's patrons and donors. Or whether it, it's something like Red Hat, where yeah. they're, they're making all their their money on on sort of the the service side of things sure. and helping people maintain their open source mm-hmm. infrastructure. And that's why I think the prospects of that open movement uh, project are are low. Not this this um, uh, SPMT one, but the other one that I was talking about. Uh, the fact that they want to raise three hundred thousand euros to be able to do that initial production run, and they're not going to release any of this into the world until they they get those out there. Well, unless they have a business model, then, you know, or they have backers or they have some sort of investors, there's no way that's ever going to happen. It, it's just not, it's just not feasible if you don't have a business model that supports it. And just being able to say, oh, I want this out in the world and I want to be able to share this design 
is not a business model. Uh, that doesn't keep the lights on. That doesn't keep food in your belly. So you, they need something to to actually get that money if that's how they want to go about doing it. To play devil's advocate here, I, I think, or I'm hopeful that they they do actually have a, a possible business model there. Because mm. if they were to say be the the open source movement, where it's just kind of like a a buffet for movement parts, mm-hmm. where you come up and you're like, you know, I want to make uh, a movement based on this design, uh, but uh, I'm not going to need this spring here. Uh, I only need the main gears from the gear train. I sure, don't need I don't the need the plates. I don't yeah. need the. And you just yeah. essentially say, okay, I'm going to order 300 x of, of all of these different components, but mm-hmm. I'm going to leave all these other components alone. I don't actually mm-hmm. need those. And then I'm going to use all the CAD files to to develop and build using the these components that I've been able to to source from them. Um, I think that actually holds uh, potential for success as, as an open source movement. The, the trouble is getting to that point. Right. And, and that's the hurdle that you have to get over. They do talk about having kits available for watchmakers. And I get the impression that that's sort of where they want to go with it. They want to have kits that they can sell to people, whether it's entire kits and movements, whether it's only certain components of whatever. I, they, they don't really go into that. And that, that would be fine. Uh, but again, how do you get to that point? How do you get to the point where Chris Manning in Ottawa, Canada, is giving you thousands of euros for a bunch of kits that he can then make into his own watch. How do you get from point A to point B, mm. where point B is that ha- me handing them money? Because I, I can't hand them 300,000 euros, but I'm happy to hand them thousands of euros. And if if that means that I get enough parts to build 10 15 25 movements whatever it is if that if that's what it gets me then that's fine i'm i'm happy to invest in that and i'm happy to keep them going through that especially if it means that i can keep a supplier going um you know to to pr- produce those parts for decades i'd be happy to do that but how do i get them to that point and you know having this nebulous target of of saying oh this is what we want to do and then it's going to take us a year to get to that point that that's frustrating and I, and unless somebody with money in the industry steps in, I I just don't see that, you know, something that's going to happen anytime soon, especially with what we're going through right now. The, the industry is suffering and they're, they're, I'm sure there is not a lot of extra money sitting around in people's coffers ready to be, you know, put into a, a project like this. Perhaps if I was a, a Bill Gates and I had uh, an, an effectively infinite stream of money coming into my bank account, then I could, uh, I'd be happy to invest in it. But I'm that's certainly beyond what most uh, most watchmakers, uh, independent watchmakers in particular, that's well beyond what most of us could afford to to invest. Even a small percentage of that, it's it's not something we could uh, afford to invest in a project which is not necessarily going to to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. And, and that's just the the reality of it. I mean, that's as well why watchmakers like Bijon started out by having his, his subscription watch, sure. where people paid him large sums of money in advance to, to make the watches. And then once he completed that run, he then had the capital, or he started with the capital, that yes. capital, to, to produce those watches. But then in, in producing those watches, he also had the, the social capital mm-hmm. to capitalize on, on his name brand. Sure. And then just continue on um, from there. There was a, a really encouraging interview recently with Max Busser on the Oster Watches podcast. And uh, it shed some some insight into uh, a lot of the these aspects. The, the struggle of, of trying to produce unique movements, the fact that suppliers can sometimes be hanging on a thread or, mm. or go under in the middle of a project, which mm-hmm. happened uh, to him. And uh, encouraging, too, to he- hear the way that the independent watchmakers work with and, and help one another. And that uh, they, while they uh, are competing with one another in a sense, they, they don't act as if what they're, they're yeah. competing with one another. Uh, because they're all doing it uh, because they love it. Uh, it's, it's a way of life for them. Uh, but two, they are all bringing their own unique uh, perspective and, and their unique talents and skills to the table. Mm-hmm. And there are collectors who are going to have more of an affinity for, for one sure. than, than the other. And mind you, there are collectors too who have an affinity for all things <laughs> all independent watchmaking. Uh, but it was just really nice to hear from someone who is that close to that that side of the industry and has worked with so many independent watchmakers bring so many different projects 
to yeah. life to to hear him him speak to that and to speak too to the fact that um sometimes you do need someone with with weight to step in and and bankroll things sure for instance that perpetual calendar that mbnf released a few years ago that's totally different from any perpetual calendar that has come before it wouldn't have happened without max mm. um, he agreed to bankroll stephen mcdonald for a year right and and just to see if it was even possible to make what he had in mind and, and had dreamed of, of being able to to build and uh, he just sort of described in in some terms what he thought was wrong with the way the industry had been approaching hmm. perpetual calendars to max uh, max was uh, sort of encouraged by the idea or uh, had some zeal for it and uh just decided to to have a go at it and, and see what would happen and was willing to take a, a risk on mcdonnell and and that, that risk paid off sure because uh, it is a uh, brilliantly executed perpetual calendar and one of the things that really impressed me that, that max mentioned is that uh, they've only had one of the units come back for for service wow which is kind of un- unheard of with perpetual calendars, they they are so problematic, and even yeah. like triple calendars can be problematic. Date systems in general can be problematic. Sure. When you dive back into the, the 60s and 70s, when you know you first started getting the date showing up on mass in watchmaking, um, I've lost far more hours than than I care to admit <laughs> troubleshooting vintage calendar yeah. systems. Um, and you know, Max even even joked and, and called them boomerang watches because yeah. a lot of these companies that, that produce perpetual calendars, they'll, they'll put them out there on the market and then they'll spend more time in service or sure. in for service than they will on, on the rest of the client, which sure. is, is just a, a shame. And it's just such a, a delicate balance, juggling the the money side of things mm-hmm. while, while also being able to to push the industry forward and, sure. and forge new creations. And uh, I, I'm glad that there are people like Max out there. Yeah. Yeah, Max is fascinating. And I, I've been, again, he's one of the people that's been doing tours of a bunch of the interview circuit lately. And, uh, and, and of course, the video series from the Hourglass where he was he was in there. Mm. And he's he's fascinating. I, I, I love Max. I, I don't think I could ever get away with wearing one of his watches, even if I could afford it. But I love what he does. And I, I hope he continues doing more of it. Uh, one of the nice things, as you say, that independent watchmakers tend to stick together and they tend to help each other when they can because the reality is that we can't actually produce enough watches to satisfy the demand that's out there. Chris Manning, independent watchmaker, will never be able to produce enough watches to satisfy the watch market, right? Heck, even Omega and Rolex can't keep up with production of their popular watches and they're producing hundreds of thousands of watches a year. So, you know the this this competition, this idea that there's competition amongst independent watchmakers just doesn't it doesn't really make sense because again we're not while we're we're competing against each other technically somebody's going to be interested in in what in what Max is doing other people are not going to be some people are going to be interested in what I'm doing and and many people won't be and I'm okay with that like I'm okay not making a watch that everybody is going to love uh, you know a couple of episodes ago I talked about how I'm I'm starting to become more opinionated in how I want my designs and my finishes to look. I know that not everybody's going to be happy with them. I know that there are people who will look at it and go, oh, you know, I wish you had done this instead of that. It's like, well, that's great, but that's not my watch. My watch is this watch. And if you want the watch that you're talking about, then find a maker who's interested in making that watch. And maybe you will and maybe you won't. Uh, I had somebody recently talk about one of my pens and uh, this person had, had said, oh, you know, I love this pen. I love the balance of this pen. I love the way that it writes, but I don't want a metal cap. I want a plastic cap on the pen. Will you make this for me? And I said, no. There are dozens and dozens of custom pen makers who make plastic pens, and that's not what I do. I make, you know, I make interesting pens. Some of them have plastic barrels on them. Some of them have plastic parts on them, but they always have decorative metalwork on them, and that's what I do. I'm not willing to make what I don't want to make. There are other people out there who will be happy to make that pen for you. And, you know, their response was, well, they don't make a pen that's as well balanced as this. And I said, that's unfortunate that they're, you know, these other makers don't want to put the time and effort into making a properly balanced pen. But that's not really my problem. That's their problem, not mine. 
And it's the same thing in the watch world. I can't make a watch that everybody will love. There are some people that will put my watch on and go, wow, that is a stinking pile of garbage. How can, you know, how can you ask that much money for it? And there are other people who I'm hoping will sit, you know, will look at it and go, wow, this is amazing. I am planning on wearing this every day. I, I'm, you know, I hope that there are enough of the second group to keep me in business and keep me fed. But, you know, there are going to be more of the first group and that's fine. I can't make everybody happy. And same thing in the, the you know, with these, the rest of the watch, the independent watch industry, you can't, you'll never be able to make everybody happy. So we do need to work together. We need to keep these um, these skills going and we need to keep um, parts available and make it so that we can actually have a business because there there is plenty of, there's plenty of business out there for all of us. And there's, there's no good reason why we can't, uh, we can't all coexist. And along those lines, in recent industry news, Meta has been given the, the green lights to start supplying the industry again. They, they had sort of had the, the brakes put on, handcuffs put on them, I don't know, straight jacket, I don't know how you want to term it, but they had been uh, essentially forbidden from from selling their movements to an extent for a time by, by Comco, the, the authorities there in Switzerland, and which had opened up the floodgates for all sorts of independent movement manufacturing, which which has been great in some respects. Mm-hmm. But then you've you've got companies like also Kalpa that could provide you with, with hairsprings should sure. you should you want them. Yeah. Um and you know, Bosho and, and Salida and the like. We've got all these these companies now that are are supplying movements and Aterna would be a, a, another. Mm-hmm. Uh but uh you you may be able to to come across uh, some of those those Eta movements and Eta parts a little more easily uh, than you have been as as of late thanks to that. Yeah, that'd be really nice because I've been having a heck of a time getting a hold of movements. Uh, as I've talked about my struggles with Eterna and how frustrating it's been trying to get a hold of of them, they they just haven't been responding, and I I don't know why. I you know there's all sorts of potential reasons. So if any again, if anybody knows anyone at Eterna and want to put me in touch, I would love to love to chat with them. But in the meantime, I need to make some watches, and so I've been on a quest to find a movement that I am happy with that I can put into that. And there, there have been a couple of choices. Uh, you had actually suggested an interesting idea, which was uh, taking an H50 movement out of a Hamilton uh, wristwatch. Yeah, so it's a it's a reworked version of the 2801 Eta movement. Uh, they've done a few things, like put a free sprung balance into it, and and uh, they've also modified the uh, the barrel and the mainspring, so they get a, a remarkable power reserve out of it. But at the you know at the same time it would also mean that if i want to get those movements i have to buy a bunch of watches rip them apart and you know and then basically discard the components from the movement or from the watch that i don't want which you know doesn't necessarily bother me but at the same time it's it's a little bit wasteful just a, a hamilton tuner like like amg <laughs> and then on top of that there's also the 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 challenge of getting replacement parts if something mm-hmm. happens to that movement. You know, they they did change the movement enough, like they slowed the beat rate down and things like that. So you can't even just take gears from uh, a 2801 and, and put it into an H50. They're not going to be compatible. So all of those things sort of leaned, I was leaning away from, from doing that uh, because I was looking for a time-only watch, uh, something fairly simple for this. And instead I've decided to go with an ETA 7001 uh, which is based on the Pousseau 7001, which we've talked about a couple of times. And um, I think most recently with uh, Ming Tian, he's he's actually used that in one of his recent series of watches. So uh, that's that's what I've chosen to go with. And uh, it looks like I'm actually going to be able to get enough of them to be able to do this first series of watches. And uh, I've already got a dozen of them on hand, and I think uh, I can get a, another dozen without too much difficulty. So I'm I'm pretty happy about that. And while it's it's not the ideal movement and it's it's not going to have the features that I wanted in my first watch, uh, i.e. it's not going to have a moon phase on it, at the same time, they're actually available. And I've got them in my grubby little paws and I can do something with them now. Mm-hmm. Now you say without too much trouble, you should be able to get a, another dozen. Why, why is there any degree of trouble at all, Chris? <laughs> because I bought out all of Perrin's stock of <laughs> watch of their movements when they when I bought the last ones and uh, when I wrote them and said, by the way, can you get any more of these? And they're like, let's see if we can find out. And 
they've they've put on their website that that you can buy you know they've got price breaks for up to 50 or more so i'm hoping that that means that they've actually got them available or that they can get them available so that's uh I'm hoping that that's that's the case, that they're actually going to be available, although I haven't actually spoken to them yet. So I'm just guessing based on their update to their website that that's, that's the case. Well, hopefully that is the case, and hopefully that is news that is coming on the heels of these announcements from ESO, yeah. because I haven't checked back recently, but uh, around the time you were hunting for the movements, ETA had listed the 7001 as unavailable mm-hmm. on their, their website, along with pretty much all their other Everything movements. Everything else. Too. Yeah, and and I'm hoping that that's the case. I'm hoping that that, that was just a blip and and that this is going to be available. Although having said that, I you know I don't think that this is going to be the movement that I go with forever. Um, I would still rather a movement with some other features in it. Uh, it is also a little on the small side, which you know isn't impossible to use, but it's annoying when you've got this tiny little twenty three point three millimeter diameter movement floating in a 42 millimeter case and it, it's it's a little bit silly that's a bit annoying but it's again it's not a deal breaker uh it's the fact that i it doesn't have a lot of the features that i want in some of my other watches moon phase being the primary one uh, i'd love to do a gmt watch that's that's one of my my next ones and that's something that i could get with a turn now if i can't get that through them you know i'll go through somebody like salita i know that they have a variety of watches available and a variety of movements available that i can get I just I don't know yet what they're you know what it's like to to get stuff from them and also unlike the Eterna it's not a modular system so it's not all based on the same size movement so I any you know if I go from one movement to another I may have to change things with my watch design and you know maybe change up some of the uh, some of the case design and things like that whereas with the Eterna movement one of the beauty beautiful things about that was that I could sit there and design a case that I know would work with their caliber 39 movements and I'd be able to to use it and I would just be able to drop it in and put a new dial on and away I go. Uh, hopefully Eterna comes back to to uh, to doing things eventually, but uh, if not, then I'll go uh, digging around for some other suppliers. Yeah, hopefully, because you, you may end up with some boomerang watches of your own if you, you go the Salita route. <laughs> Well, we'll see. And again, that's that's something that I can rework them myself and, and do a little bit of work on them to to maybe improve them a bit. We'll see. It's, uh, there aren't a lot of good choices for me out there. That's that's the problem. And um, as much as I would love to be able to say, oh, you know, I'm going to release these two dozen watches or whatever and using a 7001 and then from there I'll be able to go and make my own movements and, and be able to manufacture them myself. And every watch going forward from that point on will all be completely made by me but the reality is that's not going to happen i i need to have a supplier that can get movements to me and and actually provide me with something that i don't have to develop on my own and i don't have to make on my own so what sort of impact has moving to the 7001 had on on your case design if any it has had a little bit of an impact on it uh primarily in that i've been able to thin it out uh because of how again these 7001s are tiny uh they were designed for men's dress watches I don't even know when the when the first 7001 was developed, uh, but well over 50 years ago when men's dress watches were significantly smaller than they are today. Um, and the byproduct of that is that this movement is half the thickness of the Eterna movement that I was going to use. And of course, again, it doesn't have the all the functionality and whatnot, so that's understandable. But it means that I've been able to knock a couple of millimeters off of the thickness of the case and still have it look good. I've also chosen to do a solid case back for this one instead of doing a, a crystal case back like I was going to do before. Because again, it looks really silly having this tiny little movement in the in this massive case. And, you know, the nice thing was that the, the Eterna movement that I had would comfortably fit inside of the 38 millimeter case that I'm planning on doing as well. Uh, this doesn't change it. It just, again, it's very, very easy for me to be able to get it in there. Fortunately, the sub-dial... Uh, for the seconds hand doesn't look too weird in terms of its placement on the watch and so uh, even though it's a larger watch and a larger dial the you know the placement of it isn't too weird so that's that hasn't affected uh, the dial significantly although of course i have had to redesign the dial because now it no longer has a moon phase on it it has a sub second at uh, six o'clock instead so uh, little things like that but uh, not not huge changes but enough that it it took a little bit of time to to get you know to get a new design in place are you happy with having a slightly slimmer profile? Yeah, I think it's going to look good. I, I haven't had a chance to cast any of the cases yet, but I have printed them, and I've seen them, you know, sort of seen a printed version of it on my wrist, and I think it looks good. I think it's um, I think it'll be a good size. 
I think the 38 millimeter will be nice for a lot of people as well. It, it's inappropriate for my wrist size. Uh, I have about a 22 centimeter wrist and, and it's it looks a little bit small on my wrist. But, you know, people like you, uh, that you know, it, it'll fit perfectly. Like it'll it'll look good on, on that um, on a smaller wrist. Um, uh, Paul Paul Burberry again. We've spoken about him in the past. He he tried on one of the uh, the printed cases that I had, and it fits him better than the forty two millimeter does. So I think that it's going to be nice having both options available, and uh, you know people will be unless you have you're at either extreme of the sort of human size. I think you'll be able to find one of them that that fits well. That was a, another interesting bit of, of insight from that interview with, with Max as well. It's just it's hearing him speak to the fact that that his wrist size has, has sort of made it uh, possible for him to address a much broader swath of, of the market. Really? With, well, his, with his massive watches than he would have <laughs> others. I think uh, a big reason that we've seen the, the articulated lugs and things like that hmm. come out of MBNF is because his wrist is on the smaller side. Okay. So for him to actually be able to wear some of these pieces, which sure. can be quite large, they need to be able to fit a, a smaller wrist. Yeah. Uh, so it was neat to, to get that bit of insight in, into how that has helped helped him in, as he's built out his brand. It was neat, too, to hear how much 3D printing has uh, yeah. come to play a, a more and more significant role sure. in their, their R&D phase than it was able to at the, the beginning. It certainly helped me out a lot. It's It's been remarkable being able to quickly print up a, uh, you know, a model on my Form 3, and I know that it's going to be in a castable resin that I can then, uh, you know, run through my casting process and be able to get a... A, a sol, you know, a solid metal watch out of it at the end of it, and I can do all of that in house, and I can do it all here. And so, if I need to make design changes, between making the design change and having the physical case in my hand, can be done in as little as two days, which is absolutely remarkable. And in you know, in a larger production environment like that, even though you know he's, I say larger production, I mean he's making more watches than I am. But even then, they're making few enough watches that they could actually use 3D printing quite easily for their production, you know, as a production method. They don't just have to use it in R&D. I know I plan on using it as part of my production as well. Uh, you know, for the, the pieces that I'm casting, it's much easier for me to just print them and cast them myself here. So, yeah, it's uh, 3D printing has certainly come a long way, and it's it's really making this possible. Otherwise, there's no way I'd be able to to do some of what I'm doing. It would just take forever to actually send out a, you know, send out a print um, or send out a model to get printed or send out a model even worse, send out a model to get made, right? If I had to contract a, another company to to actually turn the case and then send it back to me and then find out, oh, you guys screwed up and, and you, you know, you didn't use this dimension right or, you know, I designed this entirely wrong and those lugs are ridiculous and they're going to stick out past your wrist. Those are things that I don't have to worry about now. I can 3D print it. I can check it and say, oh, I need to shrink those lugs and go back in, quickly change the model. You know, eight hours later, I've got a print of that that piece again with the correct lugs and away I go. Uh, you know, as I said, I made a change where I've got a solid case back on this one, you know, with the 7001. Well, the first model that I had printed was going to have a, a display back on it. All I needed to do was make a quick change in Fusion and generate a new model, print it out, and I've got new backs for both the 42 and the 38 millimeter case, and I was able to do that very, very quickly. The, that sort of that sort of technology is really making what we do much easier to do. It's it's far more feasible for for those of us who are smaller to to be able to do it. Yeah, there's there's a reason it it garnered the, the moniker rapid prototyping. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's exactly what it says on the tin, right? It it is from start to finish. I should be able to quickly do something. And the nice thing is it's gotten so good that I can definitely use it for production. I don't have to sit there and say, well, yeah, this is what it's going to look like, and it looks right, and it feels right, and it's got the right size to it. But we need to actually do this properly for you know for, produ- for producing this thing. I don't have to worry about that. I can actually use this as part of my production process. I don't have to guess what it's going to come out looking like. I know that it's going to be the finish that I want. And it's going to be a high quality piece, so yeah, I'm I'm really happy with it. And just to assuage anyone out there who might be yelling at their speakers or, or phone right now, uh, Chris is not going to be using things straight out of the 
the 3D printer. <laughs> He's not going to be using them straight from the cast. There, there is going to be some machining involved in, in fine tuning some of those final dimensions. But oh, of course, it significantly it, reduces the the amount of machining time. Of course, no, you have to you have to finish and machine these parts afterwards. There, it's not going to hold some of the critical dimensions that I need for certain parts. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of pieces that aren't going to be. You know, my my dials are not 3D printed. I can't I can't do what I want to do with my dials and 3D print them. There certainly are people that could. We've seen a couple of dials out there that that have been made using, let's say, a panograph or whatever, and some of that could certainly be pulled off using a, a 3D printer. You know, obviously, in my case, this allows me to quickly go from model to cast part, and the casting still requires a huge amount of work to be able to actually do something with it afterwards and turn it into a watch that I would be happy to put on somebody's wrist. You can't just take a casting straight out of the out of the uh, the investment plaster and, and give it to somebody and say, here you go, give me money for that. That's... It doesn't work. It's it definitely needs a lot of post processing afterwards. Thanks for listening to Off Hours. You can find detailed show notes at offhours.show. If you'd like to keep up to date with the show, follow us on Twitter at Off Hours. John can be found on Twitter at Under the Loop, and Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Silver underscore Hand.